Well, what are the sort of what have been the toughest bits do you think over the last few years? I think COVID has been very, um, very, very tough. Um, in one way, I was very lucky to actually keep working because I have lots of friends in different industries and doing different roles whose work just completely stopped overnight. And that is definitely not what happened um, for funeral directors. But the toll that those years of COVID funerals has taken um, and the amount of trauma we had to witness as funeral directors and the loneliness of it as well. We, at the time, were not able to work as a team. We were having to stay very separately. Um, we were not even allowed to go in the hearse um, to go to funerals at one point. We were having to drive separately and then the hearse driver, would be, so we, it was all to do with not cross, cross infection. Um, and so the loneliness of the work, but also the brutality of the funerals and going to funerals where we were the only people present um, or people just had not known what was going on and they'd said goodbye to their husband or whoever it was and then the next thing we were burying them um, with hardly anybody there and all these rules and restrictions over what we could do and grave diggers disinfecting graves before they, we understood um, how COVID was after death. So I think um, that has been the biggest challenge and actually the ripple effects of that continue. There's a lot of burnout um, amongst my funeral director colleagues. There's a real sense of um, those years really took their toll um, and we weren't particularly well supported in what we had to go through. And, and everyone is still working and still going on, but it definitely has had an effect. Uh, you talk about the, the funeral industry, and uh, Rue's also written for the Idler website, and obviously in his book about this. Um, and um, I think I remember saying, you know, in particular in the states, it, 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 it's it's like lots of industries. It's dominated by um, you know a small group of very very big companies which have shareholders and so on and so forth. Um, have you found it difficult to act as an independent? funeral director and is there some kind of a you know you mentioned that you're obviously you're in touch with lots of them um is there some kind of you know uh, funeral directors guild or you know friendly society where you, you meet up um and what's the relationship between the, the indies like you and Rue and others um uh, and these really the, these um massive beer moths i mean are, are, are you critical of them uh Yes, very. And, and actually, I think the funeral directors in general are mostly astonished that the corporates continue because we see behind the scenes what, what goes on and the staffing issues and um, that nobody wants to work there and that they pay terribly and they are constantly implementing new management structures and all sorts of things which aren't necessarily for the benefit of bereaved people. Um, so we're all privy to that. Um, there is something called the Good Funeral Guild which is where the more forward thinking and progressively minded funeral directors and celebrants and just anyone who's interested actually in, in the future of funerals all gather. Um, and that's a very supportive community. Ru is a part of that. Um, and actually there are quite a few very traditional funeral directors within the, funeral, uh, within the Good Funeral Guild who have um, joined and actually are looking to the future and are wanting to do things differently. And I, I have to say, we all learn from each other. I have had very few issues with more traditional funeral directors, mostly because at the beginning, they never saw me as a threat whatsoever. They thought I think it was quite cute and would sort of, you know, pat me on the, on the back and uh, think that I was doing these sort of quite alternative funerals and farms somewhere in the countryside in cardboard coffins and it was all very hippie and alternative and actually that's not um we can do that but it's actually not um the main part of the work that we do um and we all support each other i'm very good friends with some very traditional funeral directors um the the funeral directors i don't tend to get on so well with are the um the sons who inherit um, rather large empires. So they're not corporates, but they may as well be corporates. And um, I would love for some of the people that inherit these 
multi-million pound empires of owned properties and cars and just ready-made business to have to set up themselves and see how far they got uh, because they have such an advantage on the rest of us because they it's all just there for them um, and um, I don't always think that they are in it for the right reasons I think the ready-made empire makes it a very attractive career proposition um, for them um, but in general everyone gets on and is very supportive because Actually, there isn't a one size fits all funeral director. Funeral directors are quite nuanced. People don't realize that you can shop around, you can call different people, you can do your research. Um, you can find that someone, the, the local funeral director on your high street might not actually be best suited to you um, and you can go um, somewhere else. So there is a real sense of community actually because it's also quite lonely, hard work. Um, and having other people who, and I can't talk about a lot of what I do with this, my friends over dinner, because it's quite traumatizing. It's a very specific um, topic of conversation, especially looking for support. So being friends with funeral directors is definitely um, really helpful. And I have honestly been so surprised by how kind and supportive um, they have been. You never, and it's, it helps everyone as well, because you never know when the hearse might break down on the hottest day of the year in Balham, <laughs> because the water tank has exploded and then you're oh. going to have to call in favours um, and then it really helps to be friends with everybody and support every, support each other. Now, we were interested as well, um, we were talking just before it started, weren't we? I mean, you, you must see families that their weakest and most vulnerable um, and uh, well, <laughs> without wanting to, you know, prey too much on the negative sides. Um, you know, what typically happens to a family? Because, uh, I, I'm, you know, just from, from, I suppose, from personal observation over the last, whatever, decades, um, funerals can lead to, you know, sort of bickering. Uh, things that, things come up, issues come to the surface that have perhaps been buried after this, this person dies. Um, how do you sort of negotiate around that? Because, I mean, uh, I'm just guessing, but I can imagine you're in a room with, uh, you know, a, a group of people from the family, they're disagreeing with each other. Um, I mean, you must have to be incredibly diplomatic. Yes, so I, I think what you're talking about is all of the fault lines that are in all our relationships, when someone dies, absolutely come to the surface. Um, and, and often families um, are more distant, um, and suddenly, if a parent has died, for example, then everyone has to come back together and childhood roles start being played out. Um, even if people are much older, just it can be like dealing with um, a group of children again, because that's how everyone relates to each other. It's a bit like Christmas, everyone coming together, but someone has died and it's really uh, quite serious. Um, and I think our job as funeral directors is to try to help everyone come to the same page. It's not always easy. But just listening to people and letting them be heard and letting them know that their viewpoint is important mm. usually really helps. Um, and when it comes down to it, we have to be quite ruthless. We have um, one applicant, there has to be one point of contact who ultimately is responsible for the decisions. And we take our instructions from them because the last thing we want is lots of conflicting um opinions about someone ordering one coffin and then another sibling ordering another coffin and ultimately we just have to have one person who is responsible but that doesn't mean that we cut everyone else out it's it is about getting everyone together and i think having someone neutral in the room to facilitate those conversations can really help you're like a kind of family therapist at half the time <laughs> sort of yes sort of and, and it's really um difficult because um ultimately my role is to be there because someone has died and that's truly awful and guide people through a set of decisions that they really do not want to be making they don't want to be choosing the coffin or deciding where the funeral will be or who will lead the service um and some questions are really really awkward and really difficult um having to ask what outfit someone is going to be dressed in or how they how the family would like us to take care of the person you know that they're, they're questions that nobody wants to have to answer ever um but we have to find a way to gently and kindly 
um, support people through making those decisions. So you're saying, you know, thinking about this um, in advance and, and doing a lot of planning in a sense is a really, really good idea. Thinking through your death, I suppose people should write, you know, write out a document. This is how I want to die that everyone can see. Um, we should think about it and, and, you know, and put some thought in it. What happens though when, you know, someone hasn't put any thought into it and just suddenly dies out of the blue? Um, I suppose what, and they really don't know anything about it. They, um, what they do is they just sort of ring the co op, I suppose. Um, and then go on from there, you know, it, it must be, what I mean is, um, how do we sort of get the word out there of the, of the independent, from the independent field directors? Because, you know, as you will be well aware, you haven't got the budgets of the, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's difficult for any, you know, we have a small magazine. I mean, it's difficult to sort of, you know, get yourself out there, get people um, uh, sort of aware of what you're doing. Um, yeah, and I, and I think it is about events like this and people yeah. having conversations and people sharing stories about good funeral experiences they have had, as you, you touched on at the beginning, that there can be funerals that are that feel good, that they are a good reflection of the person that has died and that they help people find a way through um, through grief. And it is changing. It really is changing. The, um, the way funerals are has really transformed just in the short period of time since I trained to be a celebrant. I'm 36 now and I trained when I was 26. And I, I was told um, during my training that I'd never get anywhere in the funeral industry and that I should just give up now and look at where I am now because the landscape has completely changed. And actually people are um, realizing that there are different companies that offer a much more personalized bespoke approach, um, hopefully more emotionally in tune and nuanced than some of the other companies are able to to offer um, and choosing that um, instead of um, sort of the more formulaic funerals. And, and actually sometimes people do have very good experiences with the co-op, it's just um, not not always. It's a, yeah, not, not a straightforward, predictable um, company to choose. Um, there are many, they've got many things going on, but they do have a massive budget and they are constantly advertising on the radio and um, and telling, actually they're telling people to pre-plan their funerals. And I suspect quite cynically that's because um, they would like people to pre-plan their funerals with them because then the funeral is secure um, and their business is secure for the future. So I think planning your, talking about death, um, and it not being um, this morbid conversation that you only have once, but that is just more ingrained into everyday life. My colleague Anna talks about, um, you know, death over the kitchen table with her children, just as part of ordinary life. It's not this topic that they don't feel able to discuss. So I think that's really important. And then when it does happen, when we are faced with it, it makes it a whole lot easier. Um, so I think that's really helpful, but actually pre-planning funerals is helpful to an extent but it depends on the situation and actually a loose framework for a funeral is much more helpful because ultimately a funeral is about the person who has died but it's for the benefit of the living so something which is overly prescriptive and overly planned actually doesn't serve the people who um who have survived and who are trying to find a way forward and i have seen overly prescriptive funeral plans with seating plans and canapes and every detail plan that actually have fallen quite flat yeah. because it hasn't come as out of a conversation that we've had about how people are, how the bereaved are feeling and how and what they need to do to be able to say goodbye and where they are in their grief and they've had to follow this very prescriptive plan where it just it's felt very forced so yeah, it's very different for everybody, but I think if we just talked about it at the kitchen table as part of everyday life, mm -hmm. it makes it so much better when it actually happens. And then we're more likely to end up with really good funerals. That, so everyone goes away at the end really feeling, wow, that that was such a good reflection of him. That is exactly, that was John or whoever it is. That was that was right for him and right for everyone he's left behind as well. Uh, what, what about the thorny issue of canapes um you brought up canapes just there um that's a that's a very good lesson not to be too prescriptive because i've been sort of thinking uh i'm sure lots of people do yes what exactly do i want and I, i'll leave very precise instructions so that people know but if it's over it's overly prescriptive then it sort of takes the um, communality out of it doesn't it uh, and canapes um i remember a friend a few years ago who was getting older saying you know he, 
who's going to funerals all the time and who's getting absolutely sick of volivals. Could I eat it yet? Could I eat another volivol? Um, what are the trends in canapes? Are, is, are volivols still a thing? Um, some funerals, yes. Um, it's mostly sausage rolls. I see lots of sausage rolls at uh, at funerals, but also sharing platters. You know, big wooden boards that have got lots of cheese and are beautifully presented, and um, pickled vegetables and that kind of thing, and are really abundant and really colourful. Um, that's definitely a thing as well. But I think with funeral food, after someone has died, and you've attended the funeral, you've been through this whole set of emotions. Actually, you really want a very generous spread of lots of good hearty carbs and some good good alcohol and some if you're a drinker um and a good hot cup of tea and I think um and very generous as well there's nothing worse sometimes I I look at a food table at the funeral and think there's not enough food here those sausage rolls are going to be gone in five minutes and everyone's <laughs> very very hungry so I think always have too many sausage rolls or sandwiches or whatever it is um, rather than not enough but yeah um, canapes aren't my favorite actually at a funeral I know we were just discussing uh, Victoria's mum's canapes and how wonderful they were but it's that sense of needing something hearty and grounding to bring us back to um, and maybe the canapes were all of those things and there are brilliant canapes that can do that but I think that's why sausage rolls are such a hit with um, funerals because they are very solid and grounding and carby <laughs> carbs work well after funerals why, why were volivons associated with funerals? I don't know. I wonder where that came from. Because you don't have volivons at any other time. And then you go to a funeral, there's all these volivons everywhere. Exactly. I think it's also because funerals tend to be a reflection of um, people when they were at their at their best and the time and the, um, and things that they really loved. So that's also why the funeral industry is really quite behind everything else, because um people are being remembered maybe as they were, you know, 20, 30 years ago and all the things that they valued in their heyday. Um, and um, maybe they really love Bollabons. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll go to um, the, uh, some questions from the audience in just a moment, but can I just ask, well, I've been talking to you, I've been thinking, where did this sort of, you know, we, we all have a, a kind of funeral, an idea of what a funeral looks like in this country. Um, uh, which is, you know, somber and black hats and so on, um, and uh, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and everything. And, and that's not actually how funerals are now. But where, where does that come from? Is that a Victorian idea? Because I, I imagine that if you go backwards, you know, funerals weren't like that probably in the 16th or 17th centuries. Um, I imagine it's a, it's a sort of Victorian thing that that kind of som somberness. Uh, and I remember reading in some his in, in Ronald Hutton's history books, you know, there used to be these fantastic wakes, um, aristocratic wakes in the Tudor period, where you know, 20, literally twenty thousand people would be invited uh, up to the death of, to the wake after the death of an earl or something like that. And it was like a massive, amazing party. Um, so funerals, obviously, very different around the world, different cultures, and they've been very different. I imagine in this country, in history. Yes, and the funeral as we know it today with the horses and um, the men in top hats and the canes is actually not that old. Um, funeral directors have created that funeral pretty much from the Victorian times um, onwards. Before that, death really belonged to the community. Uh, people were taken care of at home. They would be laying out women um, who would just, they would just be women in the street that knew how to take care of people after they had died. Um, and um, local carpenters and builders would make coffins and then they would be transported to the local cemetery. Um, before that, we used wool a lot. It was, um, a, I think it was a law actually that you had to be wrapped in wool. Um, to wool. Keep the wool, yeah, to keep the, um, the wool industry um, going at one point. Um, but yes, the funeral we know now was created by um, funeral directors and they were the builders and the transport people um, who realized that the appetite for people taking care of their own dead that the, the community coming together to take someone to the to the next stage um, was disappearing and actually people wanted a professional service and so that was the creation of modern day funeral directors um, they were often the people that made coffins or provided transport um, because a lot of funeral directing actually behind the scenes is logistical. 
there's a lot that has to happen, a lot of organisation, a lot of having to have facilities and moving people around. And actually they were the ideal people to do that. So that's where the funeral that we have now um, is seen as the traditional funeral has come from. It's not actually that old and it is really shifting. It's really shifting. Um, and I think people are beginning to understand that there are other options um, and as beautiful as they can be because done very well. Isabella Blow's funeral, she was a fashion editor who died um, and her funeral was very much um, black hats and horses and it is exquisite. Everyone is dressed absolutely beautifully in Victorian morning wear and beautiful hats and it's exquisite. Um, but the sort of generic um, local funeral director trying to pull that off in the same way doesn't always carry it through with quite the same style that someone it's not the same panache, no, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, uh, London, the, the cream of London's fashion crop. Exactly. Um, yes. I'm sure did. And can I, just before we go to questions, um, uh, in terms of trends in funerals, people ask quite a lot. You know, cremation versus burial. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any views on that? I mean, I, when we spoke to Rue, you know, um, someone uh, asked that question and um, became quite sort of excited about it. I think he said, "Well, he would. He's not kind of." So I'm going to say you ought to do this, or you ought, to, you know, you ought to go one way or the other. What, what would you say? And and what are people, you know, generally doing? It's very split. It's really very split. Um, so I'm the same as Rue. I don't really take a side as to pro cremation or pro burial. They both have their pros and cons. Um, the crematorium have really had to clean their act up um, in the last few years. There are so many rules about the missions. They all have filters. Um, so it's not as bad as it was, I understand. Um, a natural burial is a wonderful option as well. Um, and there are, but there aren't really that many natural burial grounds around London. And some of them are questionable. Some of them are actually big corporate companies that look like um, nice natural burial grounds. Some of them are genuine, really lovely, just fields that are run by really wholesome people and genuine to the principles of natural burial, but not all of them. Um, and I think it's more about the emotional value of um, whether someone is being buried or cremated. I know I, with from the work I have done over the last few, um, however many years, I would now want to be buried because there's something so real about a burial and it just feels so human and something so intrinsic to who we are. Um, placing someone in the ground and then throwing rosemary or flowers or soil into, into and being in the earth um, and just how raw and real it is and all the emotion of it just feels very um, like what we should be doing. Um, but I know I come from a family who have, I don't think they've ever actually attended a burial. All the funerals that they know are cremations um, and they would be horrified by the idea of burial. So if they were faced with a funeral for me, I think I probably would end up being cremated and I would be okay with that because it's what they need. Um, so I think it, it really depends on where people find the value and, and also do they want somewhere to go back to? Do they need a space um, to visit? Would they prefer to have ashes and then keep ashes with them? So the I never know who to believe with the green credentials and people um, saying how bad cremation is for the environment. I'm never sure about the data. So I think with funerals, it's one of the areas where the emotional value of what's being chosen outweighs um, the, the data. Well, Louise, this is just absolutely fascinating. A, a wonderful advice from someone who really knows what they're talking about and also has a vision. 